<clears throat> so uh, today um, I will give you an overview of uh, some of the work that I've been doing uh, over the past uh, several years, um, focusing on uh, the immunology of gene transfer in the context of hemophilia and also uh, uh, some of the possible uh, solution that uh, uh, some of them are already in the clinic, some are more in a preclinical state that we uh, develop to try to overcome these limitations. Uh, I don't need this slide. I know everybody is very, very familiar with AV vectors. Uh, and so, you know, these vectors are derived from uh, well type AV and uh, uh, investigators were uh, uh, initially really interested in this viruses because they were uh, non-pathogenic and also uh, several serotypes were uh, identified to transduce different target tissue. Only a handful of these serotypes, however, have been tested in the clinic so far. Uh, what is really important, uh, one of the major points, is that it was possible to produce this vector at very uh, large titers and very high quality to support uh, clinical trials, and that really favored the, the developments of uh, several studies. Another important point of AAV is that they can drive expression of a transgene, a donated gene, uh, for several years. And this is the example of uh, muscle uh, derived from a patient injected with an AAV vector uh, 10 years after the uh, gene delivery procedure, showing that it is still possible to detect expression of the transgene at the protein RNA level and the vector genomes are there. So it's an evidence which is supported also uh, by several preclinical studies in small and large animal models that AV transduction persists for a long time if successful. Um, this is an old uh, table from a review that we wrote a, a few years ago. In fact, the list of clinical trials for, uh, uh, that uses AAV vectors is growing, and uh, really this is we're living what is a renaissance of the field because of uh, several very promising results obtained in the clinic, of which uh, today I will talk about uh, the results in the context of hemophilia B, and of course uh, everybody uh, uh, witness uh, last year the approval of the first gene therapy product uh, in Europe by the EMA uh, for the uh, lipoprotein lipase uh, indication. Uh, hemophilia is the disease model. I'm just putting here this slide to put this in a context. I uh, will not really go into detail of the disease, but uh, I just want to point out that, the, that uh, we're going to talk about this disease in the context of these trials. Uh, it, it's an it's inherited uh, bleeding disorder caused by the absence of hemophilia um, factor 9 for hemophilia B or factor 8 for hemophilia A. And these two uh, enzyme and, and coenzyme for factor 8 uh, lay really at the center of the coagulation cascade, and the absence of either of one leads to a severe bleeding phenotype, which is uh, um, at, at best uh, highly invalidating when it's not properly managed. Uh, what is important uh, to focus in these slides is that uh, the, 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 um, it is really uh, feasible to correct the disease by simply uh, increasing the levels of the protein, circulating protein, of, by a very small amount. In fact, uh, if we have severe hemophilia, which is associated with less than 1% activity of clotting factor, it is just possible to increase to 1% to 5% the activity and uh, convert the disease from severe to moderate. And so uh, for uh, this very reason, uh, the hemophilia became uh, uh, one of the main interests of gene therapists at the beginning of the whole story, because it is possible that, that basically the bar for a therapeutic efficacy is fairly low. Um, and uh, several studies indicated it was possible to produce these clotting factors in a variety of tissues, for instance, for factor nine, um, the first clinical trial was conducted in muscle, as I showed you the slide before, um, because the uh, clotting factor produced in, in that tissue was functional, even though uh, na naturally factor 9 is produced in the liver. Um, the, there's evidence that is not really uh, needed a precise regulation of the uh, transgene expression. Uh, because levels between, let's say, 5% to 100% of normal are therapeutic, and, and so we know that we want to fall in that range, which is a pretty wide therapeutic window. Um, 
of course, from a feasibility vector design perspective, it was very easy to uh, fit the factor 9 cDNA for hemophilia B into an AV vector. Different is the story for hemophilia A, where the uh, cDNA is much bigger and poses uh, significant constraints on vector design. Finally, a very important point for all gene therapy developments, uh, the availability of small and large animal models of the disease were, was really uh, a major uh, point to, to help the development of a therapy. And so um, I'm jumping to the uh, uh, very early studies. This study was initially published in 2000. Um, showing that it was possible to use an AV2 vector expressing factor 9 uh, from a liver-specific promoter, give it to dogs, hemophilia B dogs, and uh, achieve therapeutic level of expression of the transgene. And these dogs are still alive. It's about 11 years after the procedure, and they're still expressing the same level of factor 9. Um, what is important about, li about liver as a um, target tissue is that, number one, Compared to muscle, I didn't really show you the data, but there's a very strong dose advantage. So the same dose in muscle would lead to barely 1%, if detectable, of activity of factor 9 in the circulation. Uh, liver expression, there's a lot of work done, and this is part of the work I've done with Roland Herzog in uh, Philadelphia, uh, leads to tolerance um, against the, the secreted transgene. And also, um, the third point, I, I must admit, I never remember, but I think it's, uh, it's, it's basically there were uh, plenty of, of, uh, of uh, uh, studies showing that this administration procedure was safe. Initially, I must uh, also uh, point out that all these procedures were done through the administration, uh, through the hepatic artery, which now is different, and I will get to this point, which is very important. So uh, these studies, of course, is initial preclinical studies, and then there was plenty of other more uh, formal studies to assess toxicity in various animal models, led to the initiation of a phase one, two clinical trial in which an AV2 vector was given to the hepatic artery of severe hemophilia B uh, subjects. Now, I will not go into um, much detail of this study, except I want to touch on a few points. The first one uh, is that the first two doses tested, this was a first in human trial. Uh, it was known from dog studies that these doses were subtherapeutic, and so was the result in humans. No uh, detection of factor nine in these subjects. Uh, the dose, uh, the highest dose tested, two times 10 to the 12 vector genome per kilogram, was predicted to be therapeutic. Um, and uh, this was the result, the result uh, uh, was obtained, was uh, uh, unexpected. So uh, the first, uh, I would like you to focus first on the um, upper panel. As you can see, in the first subject that was dosed with a high vector dose, um, the red line shows that uh, we were able to observe uh, expression of the transgene. Very similar, actually, to the levels that were obtained with a similar dose in, uh, in dogs. What was not uh, what was different from the outcome in dogs was that the uh, levels of factor 9 were not persistent. They were, in fact, lost uh, uh, starting about uh, week 4 after vector administration. They were lost. Uh, they returned to baseline, and this loss of transient expression was followed by an increase in uh, liver enzymes. So there was a liver damage. And uh, the second panel at the bottom was simply show is simply showing that a second subject was dosed uh, following this initial one at a lower dose that was known to be subtherapeutic, uh, and also this subject experienced an increase in liver enzymes. Uh, what is important about this second subject is that uh, there was a very cl clear-cut dose response in terms of toxicity. In fact, the liver enzymes serving this subject were five-fold lower than the, the ones, the levels than the ones observed in the uh, subject at two times to the 10 to the 12. And the dose that the subject received was actually five times lower. So there was a dose response also in terms of the toxicities. And uh, the other important point is that this subject uh, was um, never treated with um, plasma-derived factors, so did not have any hepatitis B or C, which was not the case of uh, uh, this subject. Um, so a lot of work was done around the, the understanding of these causes and a lot of the um, 
possible hypotheses like direct hepatocellular injury or concomitant infections were excluded and the focus uh, really uh, went into the possibility that uh, the loss of transgene expression was due to an immune response to the vector or the transgene, which were really the two antigens that uh, were uh, present, let's say, or associated with the gene therapy uh, procedure. Um, and so this slide summarizes a lot of work, but I, it's all published data and now a little dated. What I, um, let's say, we, essentially this is the results of these immunology studies. Uh, we did a lot of work to try to see if there was a response against the transgene. That was the first thing that we excluded. So these patients, in fact, kept responding to the regular enzyme replacement therapy. There was no problem uh, related to, uh, to antibodies against factor IX. And also the early spot assay for factor IX remained negative. However, when we look at the capsid, we did see reactivity against the AAV capsid. Um, Basically, this is probably the most important uh, uh, panel that you should focus. Um, essentially, uh, what we were able to, to, to demonstrate was that uh, upon vector delivery, there was an increase in um, the frequency of uh, CDA positive T cells that were capsid specific, so specific for the, the, the capsid of the virus, which expanded and uh, contracted like you would read in a regular immunology book in response to the antigen uh, challenge. And this uh, kinetic of expansion and contraction of reactive T cells overlapped uh, uh, basically perfectly with increase in, in uh, liver enzymes in this subject. Of course, we did additional studies to show that these cells were cytolytic, they were recognized in the AV capsid, and they were also cross-reactive uh, across several serotypes. Uh, so we, we, this is basically the working model of uh, these uh, immune responses, uh, T-cell responses to the capsid. So the, the, the capsid antigen, of course, enters the cells, is uh, taken up uh, uh, um, uh, through, through the, the endosomes, and uh, you know, receptor I take an endosome, is then escapes the, uh, the, the endosome, and when it's in the nucleus, it's also susceptible for proteosomal degradation, ubiquitination and proteosomal degradation, and antigen presentation in class one. And really, okay. And really, uh, we did uh, a lot of work also to try to uh, uh, look at this uh, uh, antigen presentation in class one and, and the T cell response. So the two side of, of really the two determinants of an immune response. Uh, when we look at T cells in, in humans, uh, and this is data that is uh, still unpublished, um, we, um, to do that, we look at, uh, we, we build up a, a fairly large collection of uh, uh, spleens, human spleens, uh, just because it was <clears throat> much easier to, to handle these cells in terms of the amount of cells that you could get from, from a single donor. And so we, uh, we perform a screening of these cells uh, looking at T cell reactivity to the AV capsid. And as you can see, uh, we saw a lower reactivity in subjects uh, younger than five. And then as uh, uh, the, the, the subjects were older, we screened them. Uh, uh, older subjects, we saw a, a higher extent of reactivity up to uh, uh, over 70% of subjects showing reactivity to the AV capsid. And uh, here is just showing that if we take a donor and we run an early spot uh, against the capsid, we see reactivity. And we can uh, actually, um, this is after T cell restimulation. But then if we try to restimulate cells after depleting uh, the memory compartment, we, don't, we lose this reactivity while we keep it in the uh, 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 cells that are not depleted for the memory cells. Um, I don't unfortunately have a lot of time to uh, show the in vitro part where we look at antigen presentation, but just uh, 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 we did several studies in which we target the proteasome, showing that if we block uh, proteasome degradation of uh, uh, using proteasome inhibitors like bortezomib, we uh, block antigen presentation on class one. We develop um, 
specific reagents uh, such as a soluble T-cell receptor, and we were able to stain uh, antigen presented in class one in on the surface of the transduced cells. So basically, we develop a lot of uh, uh, data to support the hypothesis of uh, uh, the, 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 of the model of uh, antigen presentation and, and destruction of transduced hepatocytes following uh, gene transfer. Um, so, of course, uh, this was one of the setbacks of the field. There was a long time uh, in, during which there was virtually no clinical trial uh, initiated in the context of uh, liver gene transfer. And people, meanwhile, were looking at possible solutions. Uh, we uh, did a lot of work uh, uh, around the use of immunosuppression in the context of gene transfer. And then the other point was to try to uh, develop vectors that were uh, uh, more efficient in a way that would, to achieve a uh, uh, therapeutic level of expression with lower doses. And the next uh, set of slides, I will just present you uh, a study that was conducted and sponsored by the University College London and uh, the St. Jude Research Children's Research Hospital, in which essentially they did a combination of uh, uh, using a vector uh, thought to be more efficient and uh, uh, immunosuppression. So in this study, uh, an AEV serotype 8 vector encoding for factor 9 was used. It was a vector uh, that had a genome uh, configuration, a self-complementary genome configuration, thought to be uh, more efficient in, uh, in expression of the transgene. The transgene cell was uh, code and optimized. AV8, a serotype that showed in mice to have a, a very strong tropism for liver. And, uh, okay, they already told you that. The, um, one of the, the important points of this study is that the vector was given through a peripheral vein. And this is really one of, uh, an important point because now the, the, the procedure becomes completely non-invasive and is also thanks to the use of an AV vector because regularly an, uh, an, an AV2 vector would not have the same efficiency of liver targeting uh, if introduced through the peripheral circulation. Uh, there was also, um, uh, uh, the protocol was written as such there was no upfront immunosuppression, but in case of elevation of liver enzymes, um, there was a provision of steroids uh, given for until resolution of the transaminides. Um, and so far, basically, 10 subjects have been enrolled. I'll show you some data from this study. Uh, this is the, the, these are the published data. Uh, now, the, the long-term follow-up of these studies, of these subjects, sorry, uh, will um, really show slightly different results because, of course, over time, the, the, the expression levels will reach a plateau, which is probably a little lower for the higher dose. Uh, what is important in that is that at these doses, all subjects express the transgene. Uh, what is also important is that in this study, uh, and I will get into some more detail, actually we start here, when the first subject uh, was dosed at the high vector dose, which incidentally was identical to the high dose given in the AV2 trial, this was the picture. So we start from the upper panel where in red, again, you have factor nine levels. The subject was expressing about at about 7% of normal up to around week eight. And then there was a dip in expression uh, concomitant to an increase in liver enzymes again, which was very uh, reminiscent of uh, the findings in the AV2 trial. Except this time, uh, the, the, the course of prenisolone was started and was kept for about nine weeks which really led to the resolution of the, of the transaminitis. And uh, most importantly, the liver enzyme never went up again after the interruption of the steroid course. Um, again, uh, also in this subject, we performed the um, ELISPOT to measure T cell activity against the capsid. And what we observe is that there was a strong reactivity against the AV8 capsid. Again, we look at factor nine and other antigen possibly involved in this, in this uh, phenomenon. We showed a strong reactivity against the AV capsid, which then, of course, disappeared when the uh, steroids were administered. 
uh, but as a lympholytic drug, so that's expected, but it's important to know that never came back. So the, the, the T cell activity uh, was gone even after, long time after immunosuppression was discontinued. And so um, I'm going to close this part of the um, uh, T cell responses to the AV capsid by saying that, uh, of course, uh, uh, I think I convinced you they can be triggered, the T cells, by the administration of uh, an AV vector. Uh, they, their, their magnitude and consequences seems to be related to the dose, the total dose given. In fact, uh, and then one confounding point is that only some subject will have a, a, a consequence related to these uh, T cells, but it's not really clear why. Uh, just, uh, I'm going to add just a few slides showing that recently we, we published something showing a paper showing that uh, we are looking in possible alternatives to manage these T cell responses. And in this case, basically, we used uh, 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 peptides. Uh, these are in vitro experiments. Uh, we use peptides that are shown to be, we show that they can expand um, CD4, CD25, FOX3 uh, T cells in vitro. You can see here, this is the proportion of the cells. And uh, so we are looking into using these peptides to, to use a non-pharmacological non, non immunosuppression method to uh, decrease vector immunogenicity. And so um, basically here, this slide shows that if we use these, uh, these peptides, which are derived from IgG, uh, the FC portion of IgG, we can block uh, CTR responses against the AV in vitro and in vitro. But before, I'm going fast here because I want to go into some more uh, details on the, uh, the second part of the immune response against the AV. So this is basically, we express this peptide tagged to the AV capsid in vivo, and we show that we can decrease T cell reactivity against uh, AV and increase the uh, amount of regulatory T cells in spleen of mice. So I'm going to the next uh, part of the talk. Um, I think I still have a little bit of time. Um, talking about antibodies, I added this little cartoon here. Um, not very fancy, but uh, antibodies to AV are, are very important are very important because they can really have a profound impact to, on, on, on vector transduction. Uh, so this is a survey uh, published by uh, Carole Mazurier et Geneton, showing a little bit the prevalence of uh, uh, anti-AV antibodies. <clears throat> As you can see, uh, up to 60% of individuals will have a, a, a detectable AV titer. Now, the other point that I want to um, to, to bring your attention to is that the cutoff using this study is very high. 1 to 20 is, uh, is basically measures, you need to dilute the, the, your, your, uh, your serum 20 times to uh, see 50% uh, neutralization in your, of, of, your vector, of your vector that you're using in the assay. So it's a fairly high titer. And in fact, you can see that uh, uh, this is an experiment <clears throat> done in monkeys a titer much lower, one to five, can completely block transduction of the liver with an AV8 vector when the vector is given uh, intravenously. Uh, again, uh, it's not only a preclinical result, this, this was also observed in the AV2 trial. In fact, uh, uh, there was a second subject dose at the high vector dose, which really did not have any expression levels because he had a titer of one to 17. Um, one more uh, uh, point to add to the problem of uh, antibodies against AV is the fact that um, they persist. So this is the case of, uh, these are some subjects taken from the different AV trials that were conducted in Philadelphia. And you can see they were, these serum samples were taken up to 10 years after gene transfer. And even though the baseline was very clean, at 10 years after, this subject have very high titer against AV2, which was the vector that was given. And these, these antibodies, of course, they cross-react also with AV8. So it will be, be very hard to re-administer vector in this subject. And I must say, this subject, none of them uh, was lucky enough to have uh, expression of transgene. So 
it's a big problem which will be faced uh, uh, not only in hemophilia but other other uh, studies, other indication. For instance, uh, muscular dystrophy could be one. Uh, quick list: several possible solutions were thought out, but uh, it doesn't look they. I mean, there's some efficacy uh, documented, but the problem is that uh, for none of these solutions that seem to really work well when the titer is high, higher than one to 100 or around one to 1,000. I'm going to skip this part. And uh, so the idea was, can we design uh, better strategies to, uh, to, to overcome the limitation of antibodies against AAV. And so we start thinking about it. It's still one of my main interests. Uh, and we started from the results in the AV2 and the AVA trial. So we started to look at these results. And it's interesting because the vector dose is given in the AV2 trial and those in the AVA trial were very similar. But then the results were different. So expression levels, OK, this is another number, but it's a, basically the 2 and the 8 were uh, um, at the high dose behaved sort of similarly. But there was no expression at the lower vector doses. So we did a lot of studies. I really, again, don't have a lot of time to, uh, uh, to show you the data. Uh, we compare uh, AV2 with AV8. We have data in monkeys showing that really there's not a lot of difference. If you, if you go into a naive animal, then uh, basically the two vectors behave roughly the same, for instance, in primates. I'm not talking about mice here. Um, we did studies comparing the effect of having a double-stranded DNA versus a single-stranded DNA. It didn't really seem too convincing. And we started to focus on uh, the actual production of the vector, because the vectors used in the AV2 trial was uh, uh, purified by double cesium chloride. So uh, it was a vector uh, with no empty capsid in it. And the other one was purified by triple column, so it was mostly empty capsids. And the idea was, well, is it that the difference between the two studies is, is given by uh, the presence of empty capsid in one study, and not the other? And can we use this empty capsid at our advantage? So we developed an animal model. Well, the model was really developed by Scallon and colleagues in, in 2006. But basically, we took mice, uh, uh, immunocompetent mice. We gave them IVAG IP, and then uh, what is nice about this model is that you can really uh, build a reliable model of immunity uh, against AV. IVIG is a purified human immunoglobulin, has a very high titer for against AV vectors. And you can see you can have titers from very low to very high, and it's very reproducible and reliable. So when we did that, uh, we used this model and we started this experiment by first giving mice two vector doses, naive mice, vector purified by cesium, no empty capsid, and this is the expression. When we gave mice the same vector uh, mixed with empty capsid, but no, they're still naive mice, we didn't see any difference, but that's expected because 10x is not a, a lot of empty capsids. Then, of course, we tested mice uh, that were pre-immunized with IVAG low dose uh, with, and given a vector purified with no empty capsids. And we uh, killed all the expression, as, expre as expected. But then when we mixed the vector in empty capsid, we saw that we were able to restore the expression of the transgene. And this was true also. This is simply the same measurement at this one, uh, simply gene copy number. So this was interesting, um, and we decided to explore that further. And we did an experiment where essentially we used this mouse model, and we immunized mice with a low dose of IVAG. Then we wanted to have a little higher dose. Then we went to a dose, 1 to 100 is a titer. Essentially, if you do a, a screening of uh, subjects in this room, you will find that uh, most of the people will have titers against AV serotype 8 below 1 to 100. So this is sort of our goal. If we go, if we're able to overcome this titer, we're good. It's already a good result. 
And then this would be a title of, uh, um, let's say, in the context of a vector administration, for instance. And so once we had the model, we went on and uh, did a titration of uh, uh, empty capsids. Uh, we gave always the same vector gene on those, mixed an increasing amount of empty capsid. And you can see how, basically, depending on the titer, you need to add uh, uh, 10x for a low titer, 50x for 1 to 10, 100x to 1 to 100 to reach 100% of about 100% of expression shown here by the column at the left. Uh, however, very high titers, very hard to overcome. What is also important is that uh, uh, you cannot really go crazy with this approach, but you, if you really exceed, then you have uh, a problem with vector um, receptor binding competition. So in this case, too much, too many empty capsids are actually uh, uh, inhibiting vector transduction. I'll go back to, to that point in a second. Uh, we did some other studies showing essentially we wanted to look a little bit, uh, sound a little bit mechanistic. Uh, I'm not sure this is really mechanistic, but what we did uh, was immunizing mice with IVIG and then uh, giving them increasing amount of uh, uh, empty capsid with the same vector dose. And essentially, we only uh, measured uh, the presence of uh, antibody capsid complexes in plasma the day after uh, administration of the vector, and we were able to detect them. And also, in response to the, the administration of more or vector in empty capsid, you can see how the antibody Tighter retrieved from these mice was dropping. And the drop in antibody titer was associated with the re uh, rescue of expression. So really, uh, the bottom line, which is very obvious probably from the beginning, is that uh, this is kind of the model. If you, if you um, outnumber your vector with decoy particles, which is simply a fancy name for uh, empty capsid, you can really save them from neutralization uh, uh, by antibodies. Uh, we validated this, uh, this point, this, this uh, strategy in monkeys, because really the, the, the mouse model is artificial. It's not that we, ask B cell, we have B cells making antibodies in mice. We, they, those are passively immunized. Different is in monkeys, the uh, monkeys are natural hosts for AV. So when we did that, as you can see, the E stands from vector formulated in empty capsid. We see a boost in expression. And also in monkeys, we see shortly after vector administration the presence of antibody uh, capsid complexes, which luckily do not persist. And in fact, uh, you don't really need to uh, know much about this slide, except the fact that we didn't really see a lot of toxicity well, we didn't see any toxicity at all in these animals. And uh, uh, probably also because the overall amount of protein that is uh, involved in this uh, vector administration is fairly low compared to, let's say, enzyme replacement therapy or antibody therapy. Uh, in fact, 10 to the 14 AV particles is only 0.6 milligram of protein. This is an important point supporting the safety of this approach, uh, which is currently being tested in, in the clinic. Uh, I'm about to finish. I will add uh, just a few slides uh, to, to just uh, uh, remind myself and, and, and the audience that we have a problem, which is we want to, now we are advocating to give more capsid to people, but uh, I just try to convince you that the capsid is antigenic. So there's a problem here. And so we try to understand what we could do to really uh, face this problem. Uh, we did something very simple, uh, which uh, could be further explored, I would say, but just to give the idea or the concept. We uh, took a, a paper where basically they, they mapped the receptor of AV2. We took an AV2 capsid uh, vector and we killed it. So we basically mutated the receptor uh, of, the, of the AV2 to make it non-infectious. And, uh, well, uh, it works because simply it's not transducing cells, but this is published stuff. Uh, so it's not really, this was basically it means that we can do cloning. Uh, but we're, and also, this is in vivo, of course. Um, we show also that if we use this um, 
and wall type AV2, we can get factor nine if we give it to a mouse, but this vector really doesn't work. Is not uh, uh, transducing the liver, and it's also the gene copy number. You can see that. Um, so what is important is that then we made the empty capsis of this variant, which we called 585-8, because these are the two amino acids that are changed. And uh, um, we were able, this is an AV2 vector. And is, AV2 is the most prevalent serotype in the population. And so uh, we showed that we can use AV2 to rescue AV8. And since they're not competing for the same receptor, we can use AV, this mutant uh, to, um, and it's also, the receptor is also killed, um, at very high doses, we can still rescue uh, AV8 expression without competing for liver transduction, without seeing the inhibition that you would see uh, normally. And also we use the same approach and tested whether we could use one serotype for all. And so we uh, showed that, of course, AV2 can rescue AV2, but it works well with five, with six, and uh, partially with this uh, DJ, which is um, it's a shuffling mutant, mutant de de developed by the K lab. So uh, basically, perhaps is a step forward towards a universal decoy that would uh, fit, them, fit all the serotypes. Uh, as I say, this approach, but not the mutant, uh, the AV8 vector with an AV8 uh, empty capsid formulation is now being tested in a clinical trial for hemophilia uh, at the Children's Hospital Mayo Lab. Um, we also uh, finally, uh, this is my very last slide, um, tested the potential immunogenicity of uh, this vector, of course, this is very simplistic. This is all in vitro data. More studies need to be done. So we look at the uh, vector uh, internalization um, and uh, um, nu um, nuclear, loca nuclear localization and endosomal localization. And of course, the first three uh, panels are the wild type vector. The bottom one are the uh, mutant vector. It just doesn't get into the cells. And because of that, uh, if you use it in a CTL assay, it doesn't really trigger killing of targets. But this is sort of obvious. Again, uh, dendritic cells don't quite uh, uh, work uh, this way. They can actually engulf a lot of antigen and present it even without a receptor binding. So more studies will be needed to, to assess the real uh, efficacy of this approach. So in the second part of, of the talk, before I try to convince you that T cells are bad, now I'm trying to convince you that uh, antibodies are bad, and I think it's, it's true, and people are well aware, aware of that, although there are instances where it, they are not a big problem, like um, parenchymal gene transfer, subretinal gene transfer. So it's, it's, a, it's a very um, route of administration specific, that of antibodies to AAV. Uh, but the problem is big because for AV2, for instance, two-thirds of the population will not be eligible for, a, for a enrollment in a trial. Uh, it's very, very important to have a very sensitive assay, and we, we discussed it briefly this morning. So uh, the problem is that most of the assays that are used are very, they lack sensitivity just where you need it. So low titers, you don't really see them in these neutralization assays. Uh, so far, it doesn't seem like antibodies are doing anything bad. So you just neutralize the vector, but it doesn't seem that uh, it's, it, it will result in any toxicity. And uh, um, the bottom line is that uh, uh, we will get there, but it will require a combination of different strategies, perhaps uh, these empty capsid uh, decoys or uh, associated with perhaps uh, plasmapheresis, which seems to be a good... Uh, strategy or uh, uh, other strategies. And uh, I will close uh, by thanking all the people involved in, this, uh, in these studies, which you can imagine is much longer than this because it spends a very long time. Anyway, thank you. <laughs>